Hello friends, and welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast. We need a paradigm shift if it comes to our economic and social systems. Let us drive this change together. The Just Another Mindset podcast shares inspiration and tangible techniques on how to create seismic shifts in an outdated system, collectively and for individuals alike. My name is Ismail, and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or theme that will not only entertain you, but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life. Get encouraged by listening to successful thought leaders, inspiring individuals and impressive change makers. Change from within will last and create positive results for all of us. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. In today's episode, I talk to Nathan and Susanna about the upside of uncertainty. Nathan Furr is an associate professor of strategy at INSEAD, where he teaches innovation and technology strategy. Nathan earned his PhD from Stanford Technology Ventures Program at Stanford University and holds BA, MA and MBA degrees from Brigham Young University. He has written five books and he contributes to Forbes, Inc. and other magazines on issues of innovation, value creation and technology strategy regularly. Susanna is a designer and an art historian with a research focus on the Dutch Baroque period. She founded a women's clothing line and she is the mother of four incredibly dauntless kids. What she values most is earnest attempts to live true. In this episode, we talk about the upside of uncertainty. Susanna and Nathan elaborate on gratitude and we discuss how uncertainty and possibility are undoubtedly intertwined. You will hear about what Jeff Bezos has to say about experimenting and we define four categories under which all of us can deal better with uncertainty. Reframe, prime, do and sustain. We discuss regret minimization and you will learn about a fundamental secret of success. You will also understand why a value-driven approach can be so much more sustainable and rewarding than a goal-driven approach. Finally, we talk about doing things that really matter and the human capacity for hope. Wonderful. And with that, Susanna and Nathan, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And my first question for you is, how do you feel and what is on your mind today? I feel really happy because we actually just launched uh, an asynchronous course that's the companion to our book. So I'm feeling really excited and it's fun because we actually employed our oldest child to help us get it on the platform. And we were just watching some of the clips and he'd done such a beautiful job of editing. There's a part where we talk about um, um, the moment when the Notre Dame fire burned and we were there with these people watching and he had been able to edit in these these pictures of our little kids when we first got to France. And anyway, so I'm just excited about the content and how it's coming across. So I'm feeling happy. Yeah. And I was thinking about how, so one of the principles we talk about in the book, so the book, The Upside of Uncertainty is all about, you know, what did we learn from innovators, creators, designers about navigating uncertainty? And there's a section in that book, which is about how do you sustain yourself through difficult times and emotions. And one of the tools we talk about in there is, is not exclusive to us, certainly, but it was one of the things we saw in the interviews we did, which was an old, an old principle and from philosophy called memento mori, which is just remember you will die. And what that does is it, it heightens your awareness or your gratitude for the present moment. So we we're really lucky we get to live in France uh, because we stepped into the unknown a lot of times, but also because, you know, we got lucky, we're fortunate, and we want to acknowledge that. But so we're in, we're in the Tuileries Garden, and Susanna reminded me of this writer we really admire. Her name was MFK Fisher. She wrote about food, but actually she really wrote about the really important things of life. And, and I think if she had been in our current era, she would have gotten credit for her writing like a Hemingway or a, another, you know, Fitzgerald, because it's really great writing. But she 
she was in love with this um with this with with this person the love of her life and he passed away early and they'd always talked about how they wanted to get one of the little teeny apartments up at the top of the buildings that looked over the Tuileries apartment. And so for me, it was really impactful because I remembered what we wrote about in the book. And I remembered, Susanna reminded me of what MFK Fisher had said. And I just had this immense sense of gratitude to be alive that, that I got to be here. And Susanna said something really poignant. She said, well, I'm here now and somebody else will be here at another time. But how do we, even though we have this day, we've got a lot of work, we just launched the course, I'm writing papers and things. How do we be really prescient about the fact that, that we're, we're, we, we may be getting the thing that somebody else was just dreaming about? Mm, showing that gratitude and being able to also appreciate what we have, even though there might be uncertain times that you don't know what's there to come. And we're going to talk about, obviously, quite a bit about the upside of uncertainty. But we, before we go into the different chapters of the book and different topics of the book, I would be very interested to hear from the two of you what inspired you to write this book together as a married couple. I'll let Nathan go first because we, we have good answers, both of us. But. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you have to understand. So for me, like I'm, I'm, I guess I would self-describe as a curious character, said differently, a nerd who believe. So I believe that uncertainty, generally speaking, is this really important topic for my field, which is strategy and innovation to address and that it has not addressed well. So I see it as this kind of, really fundamental circumstance that has become more relevant lately because it has increased, but that really changes the nature of our theories and frameworks. So my whole kind of academic effort underneath it is really about how do we deal with uncertainty? And for me, this book was a long running uh, aspiration because I've gotten to interview innovators for the last 20 years. And what I noticed is they're really good at navigating uncertainty and I'm not very good. So I wanted to pick up clues. How could I do this? Better? Because it was clear to get to something new, to do an innovation, to achieve anything new, you have to step into the known. So that was really where my, my interest started, but I, and I would come home and I would share these interviews for years with Susanna and she would have like a great idea. And a week later it would be my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I will confess. Um, but but there's another aspect to it as well, which is I, I think I struggle with it, whereas I think Susanna has developed, you know, has a greater capacity and, and wisdom for it. So maybe I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I'll just say joining Nathan was really a fun and obvious choice once we realized that he had he brought all of that academic and um the, all the conversations that I hadn't been there for. And I brought more of an intuitive sense of uncertainty, not being the worst thing in the world. I, I had found that in my own life and in our lives as parents and as a couple, everything that we were, that we had been able to do that we loved and celebrated had only happened because we'd been willing to take risks and, and change our lives in some big ways. And so, um, I wanted to make the book more personal and more human. And so that was kind of the side I brought is I knew he would have all these amazing experiences and stories from the business world. And I wanted to talk, I wanted it to be written to the human inside the manager. And so we teamed up and we're excited about how it turned out. And I think that is exactly what makes this book so rich. It's a really nice combination of business and research and studies and this personal twist as well. And thank you very much for the answer on why to write a book together. And I would be very interested because you are married for 25 years plus, if I'm not mistaken. And this is the first book that you wrote together. There are uncertainties if you start writing a book, I suppose. So I would be interested if something comes to mind, what went completely different than expected while or after writing this book? Well, I, I would just jump in and say, um, we have really different working styles and um, we have really different ways of viewing the world. And, you know, and I, I would describe it where, where Susanna tends to fly really high and be able to see the big picture. And I tend to be really, up close, you know, I'm, I'm like the woodpecker pecking the tree and she's like the snow goose flying high. And 
I think we clashed over that initially, <laughs> to be honest. And it was really learning to appreciate each other's complementarity, which is really like stepping back and probably, let's be honest, more for me. Uh, Cause you know, once you know something, you think you know something, right? And, and it was stepping back and saying, okay, what is this person really saying? And, and what are they, uh, and what's the value in it? Even if maybe I don't believe it's a hundred percent correct. There's a reason why they're saying it. So maybe there's a nugget of truth in there. And I think when we started to see that complementarity and really work with that and, and, and believe that that complementary had value, then it, you know, then it worked. But the part that went totally different than expected was, uh, was for me was that, and, and I think that's actually a recipe for working with anybody. But I guess the other thing that was weird was in all my prior books I'd written, I had put in a proposal to Harvard and they had said yes. And then I wrote the book. And then in the spirit of uncertainty, even though I've been to, this is not a pandemic book, I've been talking to them about the pandemic. I think it really affected their willingness to do something new. So when we actually showed up with the proposal, even though I'd been talking to the editor and they're like, we want this, like, well, I don't know, we'll wait and see. So we actually wrote the book without knowing that anybody would want it. And what was super cool about that is we wrote more of the book we wanted to write. And, and so that was actually a really, that was an upside of that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It really liberated us to not have this idea of who the publisher was and even the audience. And I would just say that I got to realize, Ooh, I like writing. Um, I've always written, I, I did a master's in art history, so I'm kind of an academic too, but I didn't realize I would like teaching it so much. So it's kind of opened my world to being able to teach and do workshops for people. And I've loved that so much. Um, and, you know, most recently I've done more design and creative projects. So now I'm kind of joining Nathan on stage and it's pretty hysterical because I, I love the spontaneity. Like you were saying, you know, I love the conversation more than the very, you know, bullet point PowerPoint slide version of things. So I think keeps me grounded. I love that other part. So there you go. Complementarity. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. And what I hear is that this uncertainty can or will eventually open doors to new worlds or to new opportunity. And maybe we can look a little bit deeper there. What is the difference for the two of you between uncertainty and risk? And why does it matter? Well, I don't mean to talk first, but I'll jump in there because I have a very nerdy academic yeah, definition, like uh, which is uh, Frank Knight, who's a very famous economist, actually painted this difference. Uh, he defined risk as the conditions where we know the variables involved in the probability distribution. We just don't know the outcome or expected value. So think about rolling two dice. You know you're going to get between two and 12 and the likelihood, you just don't know what you're going to get. And, and, and some situations in life resemble that. But uncertainty is the circumstance where you don't know the probability distribution and then get a little more extreme, you may not know the variables involved and then get a little more extreme. You may not even have a mental model with how to think of that. That's maybe what we more call ambiguity in the academic world. But for our purposes, we really kind of think more about uncertainty, ambiguity as being in the same bucket. And that is, we just don't have the information. The circumstances are changing it's foggy. We don't know what to do or how to do it or what will happen. And it can be more or less extreme, but that's, you know, that's, and so sometimes we say risk this, risk that, but we really mean uncertainty. So. Yeah, that answers it. I, I think one thing we always want to make sure people understand is we don't think all uncertainty is good. Mm -hmm. And we don't think taking willy nilly risks of things that are, could really hurt, harm or hurt people is good. And so it's more about when we face an uncertainty that we didn't choose, how do we do that with more courage and heart? And when we're going after uncertainty, or because, after possibility, yeah, after something we want and there's uncertainty involved, how do we even expand what we're thinking is possible? Because sometimes people aren't seeing the whole scope of what is available to them because they're not used to seeing uncertainty as just the natural, you know, thing that is the portal to possibility. I, I like your answer to that. No, oh, absolutely. And I'm sure we're going to talk about reframing of um, uncertainty quite a bit. And what I hear is that once you face uncertainty, that you do not shut down and stop doing what you had to do, but that you take educated decisions on how to move 
forward. And I would like to use a quote here, and that is uncertainty and possibility. It's two sides of the same coin. Could you explain what you mean by that? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, basically what we realized talking to all these path breakers and, and leaders and managers was that they had come to realize that uncertainty did not mean that they should avoid it or stop. And the problem is that we are wired to fear uncertainty. So uh, just from evolution, you know, usually something that was unknown was very likely, you know, maybe even lethal or dangerous. And so we now have this kind of wiring for that very um, ancient brain, you know, um, evolutionary brain. basically when we are wired to fear it, it is such a physical uh, anxious feeling that instead of thinking, oh no, this means I'm not supposed to do it. There are ways to learn to say, oh, this is just normal. My, I haven't been here yet before, but what is potentially waiting for me on the other side? And so, yes, every possibility that we want is going to first be felt as some uncertainty and, and every possibility we want to have will probably not come without some measure of uncertainty. So literally they're linked together and people who have just been able to figure that out and don't worry about it anymore are more likely to, to wait around and not let the uncertainty rattle them and make them stop going for it. And I guess I'll add to that. I mean, there's, I mean, you touched on this, but there really are two kinds of uncertainty we address. There's the uncertainty you choose when you pursue a possibility. In other words, realizing there's this possibility, I'm going to have to step into the dark here. And if you're honest with yourself, if you look back on your own life, you'll see that all the big things that happened to you came after the big you, things that you love, that you love. Yeah. It, but, but, but that plan, that's kind of more planned. Like you made a choice, but as we all learned with, for example, the pandemic, or we've learned in other aspects of our life, uncertainty happens to you. You don't choose it and, and you wouldn't choose it. Like who would choose that? But this is kind of grandmother wisdom, if we're honest, but it's remembering that there's still a possibility to be pulled out of that. You may not have wanted that hand of cards, but it's been dealt to you. So now what can you play with that hand of cards? And that's, I think that's the other aspect of what we try to do is to help people see that uncertainty in a different light, not just to see it because, you know, we know, again, that's grandmother wisdom, but, but how to do it. There is another component which I would like to understand, and I very much like the story, let's just call it, of you, Nathan, being offered a job at INSEAD. And you, as a family, were faced with a decision. Do you leave behind a very certain and comfortable, but also very hard earned position in the United States and moved to France for that. And you talk about that you were comparing the uncertainty of the new against the certainty of what you know, and that this is somewhat of a flawed approach. It's taking place in our head. So I don't know if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, that was, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy you pulled that story out because it's a nice illustration of a principle or a tool. So uh, in the upside of uncertainty, we actually have 42 tools. <laughs> it's an incredible number. So we organize that around uh, the forearms of the first aid cross. Uh, and the forearms are reframing, priming, doing, and sustaining. And reframing is, reframing is about acknowledging this point you mentioned. Uncertainty possibility are two sides of the same coin. So how do we and, and, and Susanna talked about this evolutionary wiring we have, which is we're wired to fear loss. So when we approach that two-sided coin of uncertainty and possibility, if we focus on the uncertainty, it'll, it'll spark our evolutionary warning system. If we focus on the possibility or the game, we're calmer and we can make better decisions because we're not acting out of fear, we're acting out of reason very much system one, system two thinking that, that, uh, that Daniel Kahneman talks about in his work of beha and behavioral economics. Um, but with the, the story about this decision, uh, it, it's a common challenge. How do we make a, a decision that involves uncertainty? And the tool in which we that, that I think captures this is what we call regret minimization, which is rather than making the decision based purely on the dynamics of this second, 
project yourself forward into the future and ask, what will I regret when I'm, when I'm 80, you know? And, you know, even, you know, Jeff Bezos isn't quite the hero that he was when, you know, he started Amazon and it was like really wild west territory and the internet, nobody would put their credit card in line online. But he talked about how he made this decision to leave a really high paying job, a, re a really prestigious job. And he said, it was easy because I projected myself to age 80 and I, and I realized I would not regret trying and failing. But the one thing I would regret is never having tried. And now when you ask yourself that regret minimization question, it's, 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 it's not always that you should try. Sometimes, yeah, you would regret trying and failing. And, and so don't do it. You know, a, a similar principle is what we call affordable loss. Uh, you know, you, you, what's an affordable loss that you can you do? Uh, and, and for us, you know, again, as we went deeper into how do you make decisions, you know, you tapped into the principle of the other aspect is compare apples to apples. So often when we're making these choices, we, we, we focus on what we know and what we had when we were, you know, we had a great job at a university we liked. We had family who lived up the street. I was going to have the job for life. Kids were in school. In fact, our oldest was in high school. You don't usually move kids when they're at that advanced stage. And so there are all these really familiar knowns and we we're comparing it to, oh my gosh, it's France and it's a different culture and it's a different language and a different education system. And the standard was higher at NCAD. So I needed more publications and We'll make less money. It was all these things, right? And, and so we got stuck. And there were two things that helped us make that decision, which is why I gave you all that foreground, which is number one, what's the possibility of INSEAD? Let's compare the possibility of what we have now and the possibility of INSEAD. And the possibility of INSEAD, which is as a top five school in strategy, how is it going to be around? People are way at the top of their game. We'd be having conversations and partnerships and collaborations that would allow me to explore new ideas. And I get exposure to leaders and executives in a way I wouldn't get in my current situation. When, when I did it that way, I was like, oh, wow, that sounds pretty interesting. And you know what? Maybe the point of school for our kids isn't to master their math class right now, but maybe to face a challenge and, and overcome that is even more important than the lesson they learn in math. And so when we framed it that way, we're like, it became more obvious. But the second piece was that regret minimization, because I remember I had a conversation with my grandmother and she said something super impactful to me. Uh, again, very colorful, interesting character, but she just cut through it like a knife. She just said, you know, I, I gave her the whole monologue and she said, Nathan, parents teach their children to live their children to live their dreams when the parents live their dreams. And that was like a regret minimization moment. It was like, oh. I don't want to regret not living my dreams. And, and you know, I want to teach my kids to do that too. Boom, we got to go. Susanna, she's the visionary. She kind of knew it all along. But <laughs> Do you ever regret now that you came to France? And is there something that you would have not liked to learn along the process? Oh, yeah. But oh, we yeah. don't regret. I do not regret. In fact, You know, it was hard though. We talk, we write about this in the book too. There was definitely a honeymoon phase and then a very dreary phase. And, and it was a very uncertain time where we actually even considered moving back to the US just because our kids were doing, they were having such a stressful time at the school. It was different than we were led to expect. But, you know, I was thinking about this idea of the school and our children and how we were thinking, well, maybe it will help them be more resilient. And there were a lot of years where we felt like they're not more resilient. And now we're seeing that it took a lot of years. We've been here over seven years and now what they're doing is so brave and courageous, but it wasn't something that we saw for a long time. They kind of, they did have some kind of swirling years of stress and angst that we thought, have we ruined them completely? Even though they would say, no, we like living here, but they'd kind of have tears rolling down their face. And, you know, they've had to see Friends and cousins in the U.S. have different opportunities. Like our kids don't drive cars because no one gets a license here and their cousins are driving to get milkshakes and drive throughs and they think that sounds so fun. So, you know, dumb things that they're missing out on. But I would say the regrets would have been really high. We can, we can think back to things like, oh my gosh, if we hadn't done this, because we knew enough about what we tried France on actually four times before moving here permanently. So that's another thing is, Not everything has to be, and we talk about this too, a once, like 
we're going to pull this lever and then we're never looking back. You, if you can try things first, it's really helpful. You know, we talk about that being a two-way door where you can go through and come back if you need to. Um, yeah, transform a decision from a one-way door into a two-way door. And, and so ways we transformed that decision was we tried it, you know, we came and visited, uh, you know, instead of framing it as we're moving there forever, let's try it for three years. And, and frankly, that was the frame. We'll try it for three years. If I'm not going to get tenure, it doesn't work. We'll come back. And 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 all of those things help us, you know, kind of lower the threshold and fear of uncertainty. So, no, absolutely. And during the interviews that you talk to people, you just highlighted your very own case. Let's say, what role did this experimenting and also pivoting play to take educated decisions and move into uncertainty? So, um, one thing is that the the. The, what you're talking about when you're talking about experimenting and pivoting or breaking things down into small steps is uh, in the section of tools that we call do, taking action. And one of the things that was kind of fun about that section is it's the one that draws most heavily on the domain of research in which I was trained in my PhD at Stanford in which I've continued to do research in. So there's like a, a great deal uh, or a, a good uh, strong body of research supporting this uh, material. So it was both interviews, you know, so I mentioned Jeff Bezos and, you know, we interviewed him twice. Um, again, when he was in this really interesting growth stage rather than in the kind of <laughs> scary giant phase. And, uh, and um, you know, he talked very clearly about what we did at this organization is we, we found a way to do more experiments. So we, we lowered the cost of doing experiments and, and, and when we did that, we could do more experiments and that allowed us, that dramatically increased innovations you produced. Or I remember interviewing the chief science officer of Regeneron, which has been able to produce uh, therapies at less than 20% the cost of their comparable competitors who have also produced three or more FDA approved therapies. And all they did is look at the process by which we develop pharmaceuticals and say, where are the fundamental breakdowns? How do we speed up the experimentation? Um, so, but I think the most interesting, maybe and relevant for folks, answers like kind of a puzzle, I think is at the back of our minds. So my advisor at Stanford with one of her PhD students after me did this really interesting comparative study where they asked the question, you're doing something new. And it, there's so many things to pay attention to. Like, let's say you're doing a startup, for example. It doesn't have to be that, but any project, right? And if you're doing a startup, you got to figure out what problem am I solving? What would the solution be? Who are the customers? Who are the suppliers? What geography do I even want to focus on? You know, what's the technology I use? There's just so many variables. And it can be really overwhelming. And so the study asked this question, is it better to do it all at once? Just try to do it all at once, juggle a million balls. Or is it better to do one thing at a time? And you know, when you look out there at like the popular press, if you read like some of these tech blogs, you know, TechCrunch and VentureBeat and all this, it's, you'll hear these stories of these, like, feels like these superheroes who do everything. But what they found in this comparative study is that actually trying to do everything at once spreads you really thin, limits your learning, and actually limits your growth. And so they compare like startups, and they found that instead, what's better is to focus on the most critical activity for a time, get it to a plateau where it's good enough. It's not perfect. It's not how it's always going to be but it's good enough. And then you rotate to the next most critical thing. And, and a good analogy for this that I like is, think about how a chef cooks a meal. The chef doesn't like cook the chicken to perfection and then put it to the side where it gets cold and gelatinous while they then cook the carrots to perfection. Now they're, they're juggling the pots, but they also aren't really stirring all the pots at once. They're bringing the important pot to the front burner, then putting it to the back burner. And I, and I feel like that, is a relief for all of us who want to do something new, uh, who are facing uncertainty uh, of whatever kind, planned or unplanned, because it feels like we got to do it all. And that just overwhelms our brains. Instead, it's quite comforting to realize that research supports that it's better to focus on the most critical thing, break it down into a small step, and then go from there. Mm -hmm. 
Let's use this book as an example one more time. And perfectionism is a topic, I suppose. And when the two of you worked on this very book, how and who decided this chapter is good enough? And let's move on to the next topic. Let's continue. Let's go and write up a new section. How would that process look like between the two of you? Well, so as we mentioned, we didn't have a publisher on it for quite some time. So for many months, we would, I, it's true that Nathan loves the writing process a lot more than I do, and he's really creative with it. So he would write the first draft. And then sometimes I'd get it and just be like, no way. I'd say this is, this is great material, but it's still too bossy or it's too managerial. And then I would take a pass and he'd say, your sentences are so weird. I don't get these sentence constructions. So then he'd go back through and Ultimately, the pe people who know us well, like someone like my mom is like, oh, I can still so hear both of you, you know, so we definitely did look at each other's work. Um, every single sentence has been read and, and verified by both of us. Well, actually, I want to back it up if I could, because it actually there was a much longer, more iterative process under that with much smaller steps. Mm -hmm. So it started out just with this curiosity 20 years ago. And in every interview I did with these innovators, I would add a few questions. And then that evolved as those questions kind of produce some interesting things that evolved into like full length interviews specifically about how do you like navigate uncertainty. And then that led to reading about discovering other people and places that dealt with uncertainty. And then as we brought together all these interviews and all this research, we actually literally have like these huge white post-it notes with little post-it notes on top of it with all the interviews and all the ideas and there was all this iterative discussion where we said, you know, what, what agglomerates around what is like a principle as a tool? What does the research say about this? What does the research say about that? So there was this long iterative process where if you were here, you would see these like little ladders of post-it notes forming up around these tools as we wrestled with them. And then when we had a ladder of tools, again, this is all the small steps in iteration. We'd, we'd wrestle, we'd debate and we'd wrestle it is this a part of that? Is this really a separate construct? And how does this tie into that? And, and what are the, what, you know, what would illustrate this principle and what, and, and beating it up and wrestling with it. And then actually we taught these like virtual workshop, not virtual uh, workshop, free workshops almost where we, we taught the tools and we wrestle with how does it teach? And, and I've also given a bunch of speeches. And so we play with different ways to, 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 to talk about how they interact and what do they work with? And, and so it was just all these cycles of iteration so that when we got to the point where, you know, Susanna was like, you know, we talk about it and I'd write the chapter, then, you know, then that was like a quite a mature phase of this small steps and iteration process. I was, I, I sorry, I, if you saw me looking down, I was digging for this hilarious email that I captured because while this was happening, there were moments where Nathan, right when the book was finally finished oh, and I have a list of the best thing, cause I, I stayed calm because uncertainty sometimes, you know, one person is able to kind of hold, be the anchor. But at the very end of this amazing journey that we'd been on and the book is in, he, he said to me one night, I am so worried that this is the wrong book. And I was, it was so stressful for me to hear it, but I was like, okay, I know he does this with all of his books, but he was very just feeling kind of even maybe that finale of all that effort that he's just described. There was still fear. There was still uncertainty of, is this going to be worthwhile? And we laugh now because his worries, there were like seven. And one was like, I should have written it by myself. You know, and he was trying not to be rude to me, but he was like, you know, maybe I needed a solo authored practitioner work. And then it was, this is the wrong method, or I didn't, you know, attack it from the right angle. And there were all these things. And I, I love it. I, I wish I had the exact words because some of them were kind of like hysterical, given the fact that actually even probably a week later, he felt good about it again. But I think people need to know that there's so many phases with a project where even after you initially think, oh, good, that uncertainty is behind me. I feel great about this now. It might revisit itself upon you. You know, it might say, hey, you thought you were done, but I'm going to come in here and make you stressed again. And um, well, and it's I would such say, a real thing. I would say two, two comments about that as I hear the wheels of the bus go over me. Go, no, go, go, go. I know, no, I'm just no. teasing it's you. It's so important. You, it's, it's the real I've, thing that happens. I know, I'm teasing you. Yeah. I'm teasing you about you throwing me under the bus. But no, I, I totally, it's totally fine. But I would say two things. Number one, in interviewing these folks, you realize that they too feel uncertainty. It's not that innovators and creators don't feel well, anxious. Let's talk about John Steinbeck. Yeah. The greats of rap. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. Tell that. 
Yeah, he actually kept a journal during writing that, you know, which ended up winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. Well, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature, but largely yeah. attributed to the Grapes of Wrath. Which and is he has a, a yes, amazing novel. book, but he has a journal where every single day he said, I know this book is important important and I, someone's got to tackle it, but it's not me. I'm a horrible writer. I'm no good. I'm making a mess of this every single day. So this, this self-doubt and this stress of, is it good enough? happens to all of us. Yeah. You know? So, and, and so I'd add the second piece to that is, so, so we, we'd done the interviews, we'd done the research, we read about it. And we knew even these people who do these amazing things, like one of the greatest American authors of all time said, I'm not a writer. Like how many dozens of times I can't do this. But the other piece was is self-knowledge. And, and I'd learned this about myself. I, every time I'm about to publish something, I always am like, this is terrible. I should just hide it and bury it. And then, you know, past experiences taught me from trying, oh, actually it wasn't terrible. And, and it was well-received. And, and let's generalize that beyond me. You know, what is it about innovators? Is it that they were, that they're fundamentally wired by nature to like love uncertainty? I, I don't really think so. I think some of them have come to this world, like Susanna with a little higher tolerance for it. But I think what they've learned is this fundamental secret, which is you only get possibility when you step into uncertainty. And you, if you get better at pulling possibility out of the uncertainty, uncertainties that happen to you, you will have more possibilities in your life. And they, they kind of get addicted to it. And I would even say we have sometimes even gotten addicted to it. You know, like we talked, Susanna talked about that moment when we moved to France and then the school wasn't working out. And there was this crazy moment where we got an offer to put the kids in a school in the city that was, you know, much more adapted to their needs. And it was like, can you do it in a week? And we're like, well, wait, we have like a year long rental contract here and our kids in the school play and we have all these, how could we do that? And then there's a moment that said, well, how could we do it? And, and a week later, the doors on the train closing, we were on our way and it was such a relief. And, and now we sometimes talk about that as the, when the doors close moment. Like how could we find another one of those? Because we started to get addicted to the possibility that can happen. And actually, can I just piggyback on the idea of the self-knowledge being so critical? Because that is what enabled me not to take his doubts personally, because I knew that about him. It actually is what enabled me to just be like, I remember we didn't have an argument. I remember being like, okay, yeah, I'll write those down for you. Let's write down your concerns and we'll go over these. And I think we talk about that self-awareness piece in the prime section of before you're going to go into uncertainty, know your risks, know the things that put you on edge. And for Nathan, that is one of them is that he kind of doubts work that he's put his heart and soul into kind of every time, but instead of taking it so seriously, like, is this a sign or a warning? Now he even knows like, oh, I'm doing that thing and you don't waste energy on it. And so riskometers are actually something that we got from Tina Selig, one of Nathan's uh, mentors at Stanford, but it's this activity where you chart yourself on what kind of risks actually do you, do you not even see as risk? Cause you like taking them. So it might be a physical thing. Maybe you do sports or something, or maybe you're, you're able to take financial risks and it doesn't stress you out. But knowing those of our partners, of course, we need to know our own first, but even when you know your partners, you can minimize the, the discord because you'll see it and go, oh, hey, I remember that's hard for you. Let me help you with that. And remember, this thing's hard for me. And you can and fortify and even start to embrace those areas and build up your risk profile, mm -hmm. which is so helpful for any uncertainty that's coming towards you. And you're just not sure what it's going to be or when it's going to happen. No, thank you very much for sharing that. And yes, you can get somewhat used or even addicted to diving into uncertainty, but you will not avoid the feeling of uncertainty and the self-doubt at times, right? And I think this is a key, very essential point for me, for all our listeners. Even if you delve into uncertainty, it will always be there and it's fine to be there. It's part of the process, if you want to say. And if we talk about exactly that, I would also be interested when you created the book or when you came up with the book and then you go through the process and so forth. And maybe we can talk to that a little bit. How much of a value-driven approach in 
uh, comparison to a goal-driven approach was that and how does it help to have values behind a project let's say rather than what we are many times told you must have very clear distinct smart smarter whatever you want to call them goals so how have your values helped you to persevere and to go forward and to write such a wonderful book oh that's such a good question you can take it because this, okay. this was something that was important for you. Yeah, well, um, so one of the things that came up in uh, in the interviews, for some interviews, it was more explicit, some it was more implicit, but was this idea that this kind of paradox, I mean, we've been, at least I was raised in this kind of goal setting dogma, like set a goal and achieve it. And, and what some of the innovators we talked to, they challenged that logic. You know, and I particularly remember the interview with uh, David Heinmeier Hansen, who did Ruby on Rails and Basecamp and, you know, super entrepreneur. And he's just like, listen, a goal doesn't happen because you, when you're in uncertainty, the goal doesn't happen because you set it. And, and he actually was really challenging. He's like, it's total BS. You know, he's like, you actually don't control that. There's so many variables, whether you recognize it or not, that are outside of your control. And so he said, the way to like, you know, of course you all want good things to happen. You want what you're working on to succeed, but the way to be calm is, is to, is actually to forget the goal and, and actually the way to do the best work, which is the most likely way that your goal will happen is also to forget the goal, but instead focus on your values. Why am I doing this now for him? He said it was writing great software, treating his employees well and acting ethically with the market. And he said, listen, I can work for a couple of years on this. They're working on a project and have it fail. That's millions of dollars and two years down the drain, so to speak. But I would still feel happy because I would have achieved these values and I would have learned all this great stuff. We could contribute to you know other projects we work on and, and the people around me would have felt like they were treated well. And, and, and so we'd done this interview and, and then this happened to uh, me personally. Why? Uh, well, as I mentioned, this was not a pandemic book. We'd been working on it for a long time, but the pandemic happened while we were working on it. And what that meant is I felt like I had this cool idea about how do we face uncertainty? What are the tools for that? And suddenly every guru and thought leader out there who has a bigger trumpet than me is grounded at home, suddenly with a lot of free time, and one thing on their mind, how uncertain I feel. So I was like, I'm going to get scooped. Uh, this is terrible. And Susanna reminded me of this principle. She's like, what are you talking about? What are you, it sounds like you're focusing on your goal, that this is like some big book. What, it, what would happen if you focused on your values instead? What are your values? Like, like go back really into who you are and what you're about. And, and we had this- Actually, I said- Let's remember, we wanted to write this as if we were writing it for our friends or our kids, the people that we love, that we would want to encourage through uncertainty. Yeah. And, and, and to remember that each of us is unique and each of us does work that is unique. And, and I'd done the interviews I'd done and, and nobody else had done those and somebody else had done what they'd done. And I hadn't done that. And so like, what is my unique contribution that I could make? And when I did that, I think for me, number one, it made me so much calmer. I, I literally let go of, and again, remember, I at this point we don't have, we don't have a contract yet either, which is a first for me. So I'm I'm feeling all these big superstars are out there talking about this. They're probably pitching my editor and taking my contract, and so this is like a very material thing. And and I was, but I just got calm. I was like, you know what? Wow, wouldn't it be cool if I did my best work? And you know. For me personally, that manifests in some chapters and some ways we talked about things. If I'm honest, the, one of the hard things about being in my field, which is in business, is it's so unidimensional about what success is, you know? And, and so I and others sometimes fall into this trap of saying, well, you could be like great person X or great company Y if you did one, two, three. And there's a chapter in that book where we just basically say, should you even be bothering to try to be that? Like, that's, that's like not the point. Um, so, and, and so to, to be even be able to write that chapter to like, to be honest, let's say, and say like, I'm, I'm not here to offer you the three steps to be Jeff Bezos because 
maybe Jeff Bezos isn't somebody you should be imitating. I mean, sure, he's done a lot of cool and interesting things and we could learn from those, but there's other things that are not good. So, so, and so that, I, I, I feel like now that focusing on the values as Susanna encouraged uh, I, I think it allowed, it definitely led to a better book. And, and I would say, what am I proud of? You know, I've written five books. I, I probably, have, I'm proudest of this book. So, you know, what, what, maybe one does better than another, but, but I'm proud of the work I did. And that's, that's worth a lot. Well, and I think the authenticity of it, we just kept going back into that mode of, okay, we're writing this to our friends. What would we want to share? And and what would be most helpful here? And so sometimes that was me, that meant being a little bit more vulnerable. And I and I was actually so grateful that Nathan was willing to do that because he does have this platform and these colleagues and these academics who, to be honest, a lot of them just haven't even addressed or acknowledged that it, this book exists. You know, because ha- writing a book with your your wife is kind of like not super cool, and maybe a little odd. And so, but he has just I think felt buoyed up by how good that felt to go from the values mindset. Um, yeah. And, and you'll be honest with you. I remember like, here's one of the most impactful moments for me. Um, when somebody emails me and says, this really mattered to me, or I gave a speech about this in Sydney and the journalist afterwards uh, interviewed me. And she just said, you've, you've written a love letter to the human race. And I was like, wow, like how much better is that than and the other stuff I've done, I mean, yeah, objectively, you know, there may be a book sold more copies or a paper got more sites or something, but I don't know. What do you want to be remembered for it? Gosh, I think I'd rather be remembered for that if possible. I mean, I'm nowhere. I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying I've achieved that. <laughs> uh, this is aspirational, but it sure felt good to be on the aspirational track of, of having somebody said that was beautiful work. Uh, that's wow. That's cool. I think I want to do more of that. And I can definitely confirm that. So I think writing a book with your wife or with your husband is certainly pretty cool. And I definitely want to acknowledge you for writing that book. And it was good fun and very interesting and very knowledgeable going through that book. And we are coming towards the end of our episode for today. But I have a couple of questions that I ask all of my podcast guests. But before we go there, Susanna and Nathan... What are areas, and you can name them from business, from politics, from your personal life, or choose anything else really, where you would be hopeful to see more experimenting or endeavoring into the unknown to really more dwell into the uncertainty? I don't know if something comes to mind. Do I have tons? Can I go first? Yeah. So education for me, like like I am envisioning schools that are just so different that kind of go back to like um, even apprentice models or letting kids feel so free. You know, we have those Waldorf schools in Montessori, but they've kind of been looked at as strange or not like as as hopeful or like, oh, that's for kids that aren't smart, you know. So I would love education to be really looked at and I'd be I'd love to be involved, but I'm so interested in partnership society. So that's something to look up Ryan Eisler. She talks about, you know, when men and women are equal in, in situations, things go totally differently. And, and it, that was an existence in ancient Minoan civilizations, partnerships abounded and there was no war and so many cool things. Um, bio intensive gardening. I just, I want people to be growing vegetables and having potlucks with their neighbors and like going back to the old school stuff that we've left behind that actually was sustaining people for so long? I'll just say government. Um, Government is one of the most egregious areas where they make the classic mistake that big organizations sometimes make is we just roll out a solution without actually understanding the true variables or assumptions we've made. And if they could just learn to experiment, it could be incredibly powerful. And I think that's what happened in, in China when uh, when Deng Xiaoping like walled off uh, Shenzhen and said, oh, we'll let this operate by some different rules. And that created the Chinese economic miracle. And, and so if, I, if we could see more of that, I think it'd be really powerful. 
Thank you very much for sharing that. And I do agree, education, government, and there are a lot of ways that we can delve into the uncertainty and actually benefit from it. Like you talked about like having better communities with your neighbors. I, something that just came to my mind when having a conversation roughly two months ago with a friend of mine, a mentor of mine, in fact, and who's like, we have this, let's call it energy crisis in Europe. And he's like, yeah, prices are going up, but maybe we should not think that each and everybody sits in their individual apartment heating for a lot of money but maybe we can also come together right and heat with five people if it actually i mean yes it is a crisis but we can find new ways on how to deal with situations like that and i think community is one of the bigger ones that we can look into and find new solutions wonderful Susanna and nathan thank you so much and as i said i have like three last and final questions for this podcast episode and you may choose to answer them together, or you may choose to answer them one after another, or you may choose one either answers those questions. My first one would be, what is an important truth for yourselves that most people do not know or talk about? I love that question. Well, you know, there's a precursor to this project that we actually worked on first. And it was, we called it the Ernest Project, which was a working uh, label. But we wanted to find people who are doing beautiful work, who are doing work for the sake of doing it well. It was kind of a, to us, it was a bit of an antidote to what I see as the passion dilemma, which is passion is a good thing. But uh, we and our children are told, follow your passions. But what gets implied in that process, it's kind of been distorted a bit to be an idea that you have one mountain inside of you, one passion. And if you found that one thing and you sacrificed everything to it, you would be the next Picasso or Jobs or something like that. But it's, it's very instrumental, meaning it's very outcome focused. It's very unidimensional view of a human, the complexity of who we are internally. And so we just went out and we interviewed people about the meaning of work. And we interviewed people who were doing work for the sake of doing that really well, not for the fame, not for the money, not for the prestige. And we found amazing, beautiful, interesting people. And that was as a project we're picking up after this book. And I, I just think that that, what does it mean to do truly meaningful work? Maybe we don't talk about that enough. Wonderful, I love that. Thank you very much for sharing that. And that leads me to the second question. And I would be very interested, who are mentors of yours or who are people that you look up to personally? You mentioned quite a few already, but maybe you can, yeah, pick, pick a few. Well, I've never met her, but I've listened to every podcast she's ever done. And that's Krista Tippett. I love the community she's created at On Being. Um, I love Naomi Shihab Nye, the poet. Um, because she's like the kindest, most generous person you've ever met. I mean, it's like, and she, her husband too, is a mentor and yeah, Michael Nye is this beautiful human being who he's a photographer. He does these photo essays and he'll go, he'll spend three days with people before he takes their photo, understanding who they are and their story. And then he'll, he'll take a photo of them. And, and the work he does challenges our assumptions, you know? So he did this photo essay on people who became blind after, you know, at some point in their life or people who uh, had, uh, you know, like kind of uh, pregnancies, you know, unexpected pregnancies, teenage pregnancies. Teenage pregnancies. And he, he just creates so much compassion for these people's stories. And so I think those are good mentors. Love that. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I have a last and final question, and it's a rather hypothetical one. And usually I have one guest, so I talk about solo traveling. But in today's episode, it's the two of you traveling in space for actually quite some time. And it can be weeks, it can be months, and it can even be years. And after all that double travel, let's call it, you encounter a human-like species. And I call that question the three truths or the three facts. Because they can only process three facts about humanity before they decide whether or not they want to get to know us. What is it that the two of you tell them? You're too good. These questions are so cool. I'm well, going to be thinking about this for so long. I would say 
that humans have a, a lot more. So first off, if they were to look from the outside, we have all these economic theories and political theories and organizational theories based on uh, assumption that humans are selfish and they want to trick each other or what is called opportunism. And those are very narrow theories, it, it, almost embarrassingly simple if you really think about what it means to be human. And Susanna pointed out to me this uh, this interviewer, who, this person who said, you know, Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, which is one of those foundational pieces for all the folks who highlight scarcity and self-interest as the root of economics, wrote it while he lived with his mother, who was making him breakfast and dinner and, dinner and take, caring for him in every way. And that really humans, I think underneath it, we have this immense capacity to for empathy, for care, and for love. And that that maybe is really what motivates us as we aspire to be. And so there's a difference between what we may sometimes act as and as what we aspire to be and the, the focus on that. Okay, but the three things, what would you say? So One. Uh, empathy or... Yeah. Something beyond the selfish gene, the not selfish gene exists. I was going to say that humans um, are good, like good at play and collaborating and having fun. Like deep down, we, we have that innate longing to do things that are collaborative and fun and joyful. The third thing I was going to say is there's really interesting discussion going on in our broader world where we have all these crises, you know, economic crises political, military crises, environmental crises. And there are some people who say, and there's actually a person, the thought leader that Susanna just checked out, who is that we should not have hope. And just last night, we were talking to one of these friends via Zoom, uh, who we met on this Ernest Project, this really beautiful human being. That's one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. And he's struggling with his eyesight. He had a surgery that went poorly and he, and he and he's, and he's a writer. That's what he does. And, and he talked about, I get this snow on my eyes, this visual snow on my eyes. And, and what kind of poet can't see the moon, right? And we we're talking about, you know, and I was thinking about like this, you know, this Venice that we've been to where there's this crazy saint called Santa Lucia. It was like the patron saint of light and sight and how he wants to go see this saint and maybe would do something. But the irony is that Santa Lucia, if you go visit, and I've been there in Venice, her face is metal because somebody tried to steal this saint and her head fell apart. And so Santa Lucia, the patron saint of sight and light has no eyes. And yet he still wants to go. And you know what? I don't, I'll be honest. I don't believe in saints and all that kind of stuff, but I want to go for him. And I think that says something about the human capacity to hope, even in dark, dark situations, there's some spark in us that can still find a way to hope that it could be better and to do something about it. And I think that that's worth. That might be number one. Well, I'll let them decide the order. Absolutely. Empathy, play, and hope. I love that. Thank you so much, Susanna and Nathan, for this wonderful conversation on uncertainty and so much more. I will make sure to put all the links we've discussed into the podcast description, obviously. But if there is either a special way to reach out to you or something that you want to hint the audience towards, now is the time. And other than that, if you have any final words for today's episodes, the stage is yours. Well, well we did create this website called the, uh, with the same name as the book, The Upside of Uncertainty, where we did talk about all these tools. And then we did create this asynchronous course to try to make it like as tangible and actionable as possible to folks. And you know, we basically priced it at the cost of the platform maintenance. So I would point folks to the upside of uncertainty. There's a community there where you, you know, like literally no money needs to be dispensed. You can just go learn about the tools, talk to people who are using these tools and, and what they've learned and get some inspiration. We'd love to have people join us. Thanks so much for a great conversation. Thank you so much and hopefully talk to you very soon again. Yeah, thank you. 
If you enjoy this podcast and learn from it, please feel free to share this episode with a friend or two and make sure to subscribe to the Just Another Mindset podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please use the next 10 seconds to give the Just Another Mindset podcast a rating and know that you will help me to create more meaningful content like this and also that it will help other people to find this content and get inspired as well. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.